holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> yes, we are still in Mark chapter 7, where we'll finish that up here in just a few minutes. And I'll tell you here exactly where we are. We are on this verse, Mark, we ended on, on Mark 7, verse 31, and this is kind of a, a pivotal verse. It's where Jesus, uh, Jesus was in Tyre and Sidon, that area, and he took a very strange trip from Tyre up to Sidon through Zarephath, and we, we uh, Mark doesn't explain to us why he goes from Tyre all the way up north to Sidon, uh, but uh, he passes through, on his way, he passes through Zarephath. And Zarephath, of course, is where the, uh, we learn about uh, the widow uh, with her son in 1 Kings chapter 17, who, who has just a little bit of bread left. She's about uh, a little bit of flour left and oil, and uh, she plans to eat it uh, that night with her son and then die. And then, of course, uh, Elijah says to her, uh, as God lives, you will not die until this famine is over and uh, uh, the Lord God sustains her and her son by his grace. And of course, this is Gentile area. Uh, this, was, this was a miracle performed among Gentiles and Jesus' ministry is, has now uh, gone deliberately to the Gentiles uh, in such a way as to uh, sort of uh, prefigure the Great Commission, uh, where the gospel goes to all nations, to the ends of the earth. And uh, after this episode, uh, uh, um, after Tyre and Sidon, Jesus takes a trip, which seems equally as strange, all the way down to um, the Decapolis. And so Mark 7, 31 reads, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Now, what is the Decapolis? I'd just like to talk about that a second here. Uh, the Decapolis is this area um, on the southeastern corner of the Sea of Galilee. So if you're, wet, if you're east of the Jordan River, you're east of the seas and the river, that, you're, that means you're in Gentile territory. Decapolis means, it's, it's, it's a Greek name, it means 10 cities or 10 towns. This is the area which was inhabited by the Amorites before the children of Israel conquered Canaan. And then after that period, it became known as Gilead. And it was always a place uh, populated by Gentiles. And of course, this is important because in no way does the promise uh, given to Israel um, manifest itself in any religious institution. There's no temple, there's no temple worship. This is pagan culture, Roman, Greek, uh, all that. Uh, and so by coming here to the Decapolis, Jesus is being very deliberate about the fact that uh, the, the gospel is going to not just the Jews, but is being spread to the ends of the earth. He has already been here, as we knew, uh, as we learned last time. This is where he healed the, um, the demoniac uh, legion. And so the news about Jesus' uh, 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 greatness has been going around here. Now, Pastor Wolfmuller uh, suggested perhaps Jesus, uh, last time, perhaps Jesus is coming back here to go check up on this guy. This guy, after all, had wanted to follow uh, Jesus, but Jesus told him to go back. Go back to your town and um, tell them uh, you know, uh, what, what you've seen and heard and everything. And so we know at least whether Jesus is going there to check up on them, we know at least that uh, when, when he comes there, there is a sizable population that recognizes him. So I'm gonna, I'm fiddling around here. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, okay, good. Now let's go to the screen. All right, I'm looking for where I share. This is, 
Very good. Okay, let's go into the text then. Are we all seeing Mark chapter eight? We got it. Looks great. Very Here, good. Lois, okay. by the way, asked a quick question while you're trying to, did oh, Jesus yeah. go there in connection with the miracle to the Gentiles in Elijah time? Is that just a coincidence or what does, it, is Jesus yeah. doing it on purpose? It's perhaps it's a coincidence. It's noteworthy, I suppose. What we know is that uh, wherever Jesus goes, he is demonstrating God's grace. He is God. He's God in the flesh. He's loving people, having compassion on people. And um, so for him to go through there, Mark doesn't give us any details about what he, he does in Sidon, uh, why he goes all the way up north. I mean, he's, he's explaining Jesus' itinerary. He's in the area of Tyre. Well, Tyre is on the south side. Why doesn't he just go down and straight down to Decapolis? Well, he doesn't. He goes up to uh, Sidon. And as he does that, he goes through uh, Zarephath. Uh, just, just, a, just a detail, just a, um, something noteworthy that uh, this is the area where that, that, that woman experienced the grace of God. And we can be fairly confident that, uh, that other people um, were uh, were given the same mercy as that as that lady, and uh, and again, this is Jesus who is come to fulfill the scriptures. So everything that is written in the Old Testament is finding its fulfillment in Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, who is consummating all of these things into his his own person and beckoning all. The, the, the world, everyone who, who hears him, to, to come to him as the fulfillment uh, of, of the scriptures and the fulfillment of God's will for the entire world. And so in Jesus is, is a, the future and the hope of all people. And uh, this is a very, it's, it's very important to, to know that because this is what Jesus is thinking of. There are a lot of things going on. There, there, there's a lot of action going on. There are miracles being performed. How you perceive the miracles is one thing. What Jesus is thinking, and we know he has compassion, but what Jesus is thinking is another thing. And this is exactly, and we're going to see this uh, in the uh, uh, upcoming uh, reading of Mark. Jesus wants his disciples to see this. He wants them to think like he thinks. He wants them to think theologically. It's kind of like and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it's but I think it's important now that the thoughts in my head. He wants to change the subject. I I, I think you, you know this is an important lesson because people it, people talk about what they want to talk about. They see what they want to see. Miracles have been seen, signs have been given, so to speak. But Jesus wants them to think uh, scripturally. He wants them to hear correctly and to understand to know what his mission is. And he wants them primarily to put their trust in his word. And uh, this comes out very clearly in the, after the feeding of the 4,000, for instance, in Jesus' conversation with his, with, his, uh, with his disciples. Very good. So here we have Jesus in the region of the Decapolis, the 10 cities. And they brought to him a man. And this is why I say that certainly Jesus was, 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 recognized and uh, as soon as he comes, they, they know enough to bring to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, or you could say spoke with difficulty. And they begged him to lay his hand on them, on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened, or be opened wide. And his ears were opened, and his tongue released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now I'm going to pause here, turn on the fan. It is blazing hot okay very good so jesus heals 
the deaf man. Now this man has, he, he's deaf and has a speech impediment. Um, and uh, Jesus, of course, heals him in his own unique way, uh, very tactile, very, this is very typical of Mark. He, he touches him. They beg him to lay his hand on him. Well, that's of course natural. That's, that's a heal, posture of healing. And uh, it's, this is interesting it, how the language works here in the Greek. We have a kind of a quick choppy succession of things happening. He takes him away from the crowd, the crowd privately. He puts his finger into his ears, spits, touch, and, and, and then touches his tongue. They're all what we call arrest, meaning like snapshot, one thing after another. So you just have this episode kind of being wrapped up uh, in, in just a few words. And, but, all, but all of these little segments has significance. Uh, he takes them away from the crowd. And why? I mean, you could say symbolically, it's, it's to, uh, in, to separate him from the world of sinners, the world of Gentiles. But I think it's much more practical than that. I think he wants this man to focus in on Jesus. He wants to focus in on the one who is healing him. It's important to know that. That's, in fact, that's key. It's not just what is happening. It's not just the thing, but it's the person, it's the one who's doing it. Um, um, so he has Jesus, uh, Jesus has the man focused on him. Um, and then he puts his fingers into his ears. Okay, well, this is, this is typical. Jesus has, has been touching in the past. Um, and of course his ears, uh, he's deaf. And so, um, his, his ears are what require the healing. Now this word for ear is not, there are two words for ear in Greek. It's not just, um, it, Spanish has the same. It, it's not just ear, but it's also the ear and sense of hearing. So, uh, he, he puts it into his, his, his sense of hearing, uh, his oído in this, in the Spanish. And then after spitting, he touches his tongue. So he touches the two. Uh, what is the significance of spitting? This is kind of interesting because I found a uh, little uh, commentary uh, which refers to the Talmud uh, in a book called the Baba Bathra, the Baba Bathra, which says, this is interesting. It says that there's a tradition that the spittle of the firstborn of a father is healing. So the spit of, 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 the, of the firstborn of the father has healing qualities. This is Jewish literature. This isn't Gentile, you know, like spooky stuff. And then of course it goes on to say that the firstborn of a mother does not, is, it does not have healing capacity. I don't know why, but if you're the firstborn of the father, that's strange. Anyway, there are various other interpretations. Many people say, well, he's, he's, he's performing sign language. He's just, or, or this is kind of a, a cultural appropriation, as they say. In, in these days, this is how they would have performed a healing, right? So he uses their uh, methods of healing uh, so as to uh, make as if he is healing him through their means. Um, well, I mean, perhaps I think he's uh, using sign language. I think that's a perfectly fine interpretation, but I do find this reference to, to the, in the, the Baba Batra interesting because Jesus is the firstborn. He's the firstborn of the father. And then we see in the next, uh, you know, after, uh, after touching his tongue, we see in the next verse that he looks up into heaven, to heaven. He looks up to his heavenly father, right? So perhaps, uh, there is something to that, although I might I might doubt it because he's dealing with Gentiles. Why would the Gentiles be interested in what's written in the in the, some Talmudic Jewish tradition? Nonetheless, we do have Jesus um, uh, healing this man in a very. We spoke last time uh, using almost sacramental uh, uh, means. He's 
he's uh, he's using spit, water, and touch to communicate his his salvation. Right. So he looks up into heaven. He sighs and says to him, "Ephatha." Now this word. Uh, Sigh is actually a better word would be groan. He uses the same word in the next chapter eight, where the, the, his spirit groans within him when he comes across the the Pharisees. I'm thinking of a, a it's 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 kind of a colorful. Jesus, it, 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 we'll get to this in a second. He he runs into the Pharisees and it's just like he he groans. He's just like, oh brother, you know, because I mean th these are the guys who just who had recently charged him with having a demon. Well, anyway, back to this text, he groans. Now, why would he groan? It seems to be kind of a negative kind of a response, emotion. I think he's groaning. It's a, it's a sign of compassion, a sign of uh, shared grief. He's looking upon a, uh, a sinful creation, the effects of sin, uh, deafness, blindness, not being able to speak, disease, sickness, these are things that the devil wants. These are effects of a fallen creation. And this is not what God, our creator, intended for things to be. And so here we have Jesus, the true God in the flesh, seeing his own creation gone this way, uh, and it affects him. We have the same word used, or a, a variant of the same word used in... Um, Romans chapter, just a second. Say, Andreas, can you go play? Can you go play in your room? See, this is what I get when I'm. This is this is COVID reality. Everything's from home. Thank you. Okay. Um. Eh, we, we're talking about this um. Sacramental uh, 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 touching. Now you're gonna have to help me out here because my. I, I forgot where I was here. Pastor Price, I've got two questions that'll put you back on track. One from Jane who says, can you compare the spitting to baptism? Maybe I'm being far-fetched. And Paul who says, if the authoritative word is primary, why use secondary means of water, spittle, implications for the means of grace? Or I, And I have this, I mean, we have talked about this. It seems like Mark is, is making an argument here that goes both against the sort of purely internal kind of faith by itself sort of thing, but also against the ex opere operato, simply the external thing, that, that you have the external means and the internal grasping of those blessings sort of dancing back and forth in all of these texts. So, Yes, absolutely. That's great. Um, and, and Jesus is going to, I think he's going to explain that again, after the feeding of the 4,000, uh, when he tells to the, he says to the Pharisees, he says, basically, I mean, in, in so many words, uh, I'll be damned if I give you a sign. That's a, he uses the word genea, or anyway, we'll get to that in a second. And the reason is because he is, he's making this hard distinction between uh, the thing, the sign that you see, the, 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 the external, even preceding element and the word of God, which, which of course is what solicits the faith in the heart. Now, <clears throat> yes, I love that. Is this baptism? This is very baptismal. I mean, the spit is water. It's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's water from the body of God. And, um, but what's important here is it's not mere water. In fact, it's plain water isn't doing anything here. Plain anything <clears throat> isn't doing anything here. All the things that we see, and that's a good question. Why is he doing all this stuff? <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's his thing. He does it. Why does he use water in baptism? Why does he use bread and wine in the Lord's Supper? Well, I think the best way to answer that is to say, this is the way God has, has determined to do it. But what's most important is that we acknowledge that the efficacy, what makes it happen, is not uh, the the ritual that you see here. Uh, it's not the ceremony, you could say. But it is his word. It's the word ephatha, be open, an imperative. Uh, and spoken in, in, in uh, Aramaic. Uh, and um, 
the word epitha is what uh, the, uh, caused his ears to be open. It, it, what it required, it also uh, affected. It, it brought about what it required, uh, which is dis it, it, dis a distinctive feature of the gospel. You know, we get lost in grammar. Well, an imperative is law. Well, actually, when the law, the imperative of the law comes to you and tells you to do something, it doesn't enable you to do it. It doesn't make you do it. In fact, it, it makes you worse and make you, makes you less able to do it. And it reveals that you haven't done it. Whereas here, when he speaks his word, ethatha, be open, the very word that commands you to hear makes you able to hear. But not just, not just hear, but also speak. It's, uh, I think it's called a, there, there's a technical Greek term, I forget, like zeugma or something like that here, which, which has like, where a word has a double sense. Be open. Well, what should be open? Your e two things, your ear and your tongue. Your ear to hear the word of God and your tongue to confess. As Paul teaches in Romans chapter 10, uh, for with the heart, we believe and are justified, and with the mouth we confess and are saved. Well, the heart we're justified, we're justified by faith. Faith comes from hearing. Now he hears the word of God, and his, his tongue is released, and he speaks plainly. Um, and again, I think it's important that he looks up into heaven, because this is where the, this is where the power is coming from. This is where the author, his authority comes from, and this is also where the where, where the power comes from. I don't want to, I, I like exploring this. I wonder if, you know, I think of Romans chapter eight where the creation grown. That's where I was when my son interrupted me. Creation in Romans chapter eight, um, creation groans with, uh, with uh, like labor pains, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Uh, and, you know, Jesus sees this, the, the, this fallen creation that moves him. But I wonder if it isn't it also, you know, looking up to heaven to establish his deity, whence he came. And then he groans to signify his humiliation. So you, again, you see the divinity and humanity both uh, very clearly uh, ex explained and, and illuminated in the, in the same text in the same episode you always you, you almost always see this right and um but the sign is almost like here jesus has placed himself uh in our condition he is in a sense you could say here he is bearing this man's sin he's bearing his infirmity and this causes him to groan and uh he says be open ah oh, it's beautiful hey it, it, he can't hear. Why are you saying it's like, it's like, hey, Jesus, you're talking to this guy, but he can't hear. But that's the whole point. It's the it's the the word of God which creates the capacity to hear. Lazarus in the tomb is dead. And this happens all the time. He can't hear. He's dead, and yet the word of Christ causes him to hear. And this is how it works with the gospel. We're always tempted to say, well, first we need to fix their hearing so to speak. First, we need to, and I think that as a missionary, you know, to some extent, and forgive this, I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting it, I'm, uh, uh, that people are not civilized, but when you're coming from kind of a really Western standpoint, you're tempted to think that people are less civilized than you are. And uh, the temptation is to say, well, if I could just first teach these folks how to use their reason, uh, maybe s s like set up a Cato Institute or something down here to teach people how to think. Well, then, then I could teach them the gospel. Then they'll start understanding the word of God. There is a huge temptation to think that way. And yet here Jesus shows, no, it's the word, the good news of Jesus, uh, which says, believe or be opened is sufficient. It's enough to, to, effect and accomplish what it what it asks for. 
And so, and sure enough, that's what happened. His, his ears were opened, epitha in two, uh, in two instances. His ears were opened, his tongue released um, so that he could both hear the gospel and confess Christ. But then this is what's strange about this. So he's given the capacity not only to hear, but also to confess. And then Jesus charged them to tell no one. Again, this is kind of a strange uh, command. And, but yet the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Now I read, I, I read in some commentaries and I've always heard this, that these people were sinning because they were disobeying Jesus clear command. And I agree. I, I, I don't deny that. I think that the folks, I mean, he told them not to do it and they did it. That's a sin. And yet another part of me is almost like there's this compulsion that is hard to explain. It's almost like we have, like with the Syrophoenician woman in the previous episode, who it's almost like she has this contract with heaven. It's like, yes, but, you know, I know you, I know God's grace. And there's nothing that can stop me from, from proclaiming it. Um, and yet Jesus reason to tell them is also perfectly understood, understandable because Jesus popularity is on the rise and he is now more and more, the, the, the further we get into Mark, he has his face set towards the cross. And that is where his glory is going to be revealed. It's not going to be in the great popularity among the people, but rather where he bears the sins of the world and makes peace between God and the world. Um, and of course, they were astonished beyond measure, saying he's done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, I, I think we, yeah, they should be astonished. Of course they were. Uh, and again, this emotion of astonishment is always something in Mark, it's always something that is presented in the face of divine action. I mean, what would you think? What, how, what would your emotion, emotional state be if you saw something with your own eyes that only God could do? And yet, in spite of that, uh, we should remember Jesus' parable of the sower that, you know, people get really excited and emotional about things and yet the, the soil is 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 thin and they soon forget about it and uh they uh they fall away because that is not a trustworthy ground but rather faith in his word and uh that is why jesus has come and he's going to make this very clear to the disciples um later on after the feeding of the 4,000 uh, that we're here to focus on Jesus teaching. I'm here to teach you what's going on. This Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, fulfillment of the prophecies. It was written and it is necessary that he suffer and die. And so we're going to see here coming up, Jesus predicting his death three times uh, so as to show the purpose uh, for uh, all of his uh everything that he has done to this point. Again, remember, uh, and I'm gonna repeat this again and again, uh, at the, the very first day of this class, we made this point that everything that we have been covering up to this point is merely a prelude to the passion and resurrection of our Lord. It's like that, that, that crash, right? And uh, uh, that, it, we're all witnesses of this, 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 this crash. But uh, everybody tells the story from his own perspective, right? And um, Luke from his, Mark from his, Matthew from his. And, uh, but the thing itself, the passion, that's, that's the main thing. And so that's why we have Mark emphasizing certain things uh, that are peculiar to Mark. He wants us to focus on that thing. And that's why he's, he, he tampers down people's uh, you know, spreading the word in their own words, in, in their own interpretations, because he wants them to understand uh, him uh, 
as, as he has come to teach them. I'm going to stop there and uh, I got. I'm trying out a, a picture on how to preach this, Pastor Person. I want to try it out on you. I'm just thinking of it now. And and by the, if anybody has questions, then please let me know uh, in the chat. That'd be great. But so so how do we kind of measure this the disobedience? But it's like it's in some ways it's not a. It's almost like a godly disobedience. So so here's the picture is that the parents tell the child, they're frustrated that the child didn't do their work and everything else like this. And you say, just go to bed. And then you hear some things happening and you see, and you wake up and you're like, what's that? And then the children are in the kitchen trying to, to wash the dishes and they're making an even bigger mess. And they just should have gone to bed. And, it, and so they're there but they're, and they're making things worse for you. But you look at them and you see them and you're like, ah, it's so it's like, it's like compassion. It's like exhaustion mixed with compassion or frustration mixed with affection. So Jesus says, ah, oh, you're making it worse. <laughs> but Thanks, all Greg. right, I, get, I see, I, but you can't help. And I love you. And this is going to make things harder for me, but I love you. And so the, all, all these things are mixed up together. How about that for a picture? Love it. And, and it brings out the, the central article of the Christian faith, the doctrine of forensic justification through faith. It's God, it, it, this even applies to our, our works, the things we do. Nothing we do is good, but God loves us. He loves us and he accepts it for by his grace for the sake of his son. And he just declares it to be good. And um, it, 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 well, I guess the word would be grace. It's the grace of God. It's, it's the way God feels about you. Um, but yeah, it's you, you see that here. Um, Jesus obviously has his reason for them not to proclaim it. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, it just seems impulsive and uh, beautifully um, childlike. You know? Just last night, my son was washed the dishes we got a we got a video of him finally he's a workaholic he's always mopping and he's one and a half he's always mopping and sweeping and just last night he was washing the dishes and we got some footage of that so maybe i'll try to share it with you it would be a good good example of what pastor wolfmuller just referred to uh jane uh, so and i've got one more thing before you move off this text jane wants to know if pastors learned hand gestures at seminary i don't know what you <laughs> But I, and so if you might just comment on that, but also, so Mark uniquely gives us insight into the original Aramaic that Jesus is speaking, Epaphatha, Epaphatha uh, from the Aramaic. Um, do you have, a, I've always wondered about it. And I've never seen a good explanation. you have a sense of why Mark will go back to the, to the Aramaic more than the other gospels? What if he's, if there's something rhetorical that he's working on? Yeah, I think, um... I read some on that a while ago. Um, he his audience is Roman, um, I think. So, I, I I think he brings up these words, and also it gives explanations as to, you know, the, the, it, he he explains the geography uh, sometimes of this area because he knows that his audience is not familiar with it. So maybe at the same time, he, he brings up the original language to show them, I don't know, something of the same thing. Although, you know, the more I think of that, that doesn't make sense either. I don't know. You know, and again, this is in Greek. These people are Greek speakers. I don't even know they spoke Aramaic. Although the, the Aramites were living there, so they, they probably did speak Ara, Aramaic, come to think of it. It's a Semitic language, very similar to, to Hebrew. Um, yeah, I, spoke, I suppose they would have spoken Aramaic there. Okay, just thinking out loud here. But I think that the reason Mark says it here too, one other good um, explanation would be that he's speaking uh, tenderly. He's speaking, uh, this is the first word that this man is going to hear. And he's going to hear it uh, you know, in the language of his own people. And this is also the, the language that he's speaking. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's, that's interesting. I've always I've always wondered that. 
As far as hand gestures, um, I don't know. <laughs> Should they? <laughs> they don't teach us to spit and to do anything like that. That I'm not sure uh, with, with, the, with the hand gesturing. I've been told I uh, use a lot of hand gestures, but that, that's, that comes from my mom. You know, my mom, her first language was sign language. Um, uh, her parents were deaf. They met at the school for the deaf. And uh, so she was speaking with signs before, before her actual words. And it was, it's funny because I remember she would go for walks and I'd be coming back and I'd see my mom on a walk, walking down Main Street in the town we grew up in. And I could see her from a half a mile away because she's always using her, <laughs> her uh, arms to, to speak. Very good. He's done all things well, even make the deaf to hear and the mute speak. And then in those days, here, this is, a, this is a transition in those days, um, which suggests that uh, something momentous is happening here. This is, uh, this is God uh, ushering in his kingdom on earth, which has been what Jesus has been doing the entire time, establishing his messianic rule, his messianic kingdom, which lasts until the end of times. In those days, uh, when again, uh, so this isn't the first time. A great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from afar. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that, they should also be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. I'm going to check really quick. I didn't do a map thing on that. Dalmanutha. It says here. Oh, Magadan, what's that? Oh, Magdala, of course. Magdala, that's where uh, Mary, Magda, uh, Mary Magdalene is from. Uh, which, by the way, is on the other side of the sea. Very good, let's talk about, uh, this is in Gentile territory. This is the second account of feeding a multitude. Some commentaries, it's just so silly what these, Bible doubters, these Bible critics uh, come up with. Uh, what they argue, they, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Ninnehaum, another German named Julius Schneewind, uh, argue that this, that the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 is the same event. They, they, they act like, well, you know, you, you have a bunch of these, you have a bunch of Jesus sayings and little legends about Jesus going around there and then and then, uh, you know, the people that just kind of weave them together as they see. Well, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, Mark makes a big deal about the fact, as we'll see later, that there were two distinct feedings, one of the 5,000 and one of the 4,000. They're very different. They're very similar. And that's important that they're similar. A lot of the, the things going on here in Jesus' mission among the Gentiles are similar to those among the Jews. The, 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 uh, de um, dealing with the demons the enjoining silence on them, uh, various patterns of behavior that Jesus is reenacting among the Gentiles. Well, the same thing here. And the most important point here is that he is showing mercy. We have a numerous crowd again, right, says Paul. Um, and this, of course, the, the, the theme here is 
Jesus is coming to the Gentiles too. What was given to the Jews is also to the Gentiles. This is uh, called a, a big word, proleptic visitation. And this word proleptic simply means to receive beforehand. It's kind of like the in the parable of the of the uh, prodigal son and the generous father, the 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 second son uh, asks for his inheritance beforehand. He wants to receive beforehand, right? That's the idea. So proleptic, receive beforehand visitation. These Gentiles are, are, are receiving, uh, the, the, this is the mission of Christ among the Gentiles before he sends the apostles to, uh, specifically to the ends of the earth. This is before St. Paul kind of uh, is what we're getting at. Uh, now, Matthew and Mark include both the 4,000 and the 5,000, and there are uh, great similarities and great differences uh, between them. Uh, for instance, in John chapter 6, which records the feeding of the 5,000, um, and we're going we're to talk about this probably next week, uh, John chapter 6, we have a difference in reaction and a di uh, difference in... Um, kind of follow it. And um, in, in, in John 6, the, the, uh, the people follow him looking for more bread. And so the topic remains the, uh, the bread, the physical bread. And uh, Jesus, of course, uh, instructs them to labor for the bread of life. Whereas here, Jesus takes this conversation up with his disciples and teaches them to watch out for the false teaching of the Pharisees. That's just a preview. We're going to talk about that here um, later on. The, 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 the point, though, and this is like what we should keep in mind. What is the same between Jesus dealing with the, the, the Jews, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus dealing with the, with the Gentiles and the feeding of the 4,000? It is his compassion. It's his divine compassion. He's doing something because he's moved to do it. And the, the Greek word that all the first year Greek students like to memorize and, and then uh, brag about being able to pronounce is splagmizdomai, splagmizdomai. There are like, literally in the English language, it would be like 15 consonants, one after the other uh, here. Splagmizdomai, which means literally like a gut-wrenching deep-hearted compassion. I mean, he is sincerely moved, physically moved. And what a great uh, way to describe grace. You know, you hear people say, nobody cares how you feel, right? And people are always talking about their feelings. Well, it really does matter how God feels. That's what grace is. Another way of say, talking about grace is to say God feels this way. And of course, he literally feels this way. If you want to see how he feels, look at, his, at, at your suffering Lord on the cross and see him being humiliated and tortured and yet loving you in spite of it and, and through it. Um, the difference here, though, because we have the same word used in, in uh, Mark chapter 6, in the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, but the difference is that there, in the feeding of the 5,000, it's compassion for sheep, whereas Gentiles are not described as, as sheep, typically. That's, that's, that's an Israel thing. The shepherds are traditionally the kings of Israel, all right? And um, the sheep are, is the flock of Israel. And here, uh, we, among the, the, um, the 4,000, they're not sheep, but we have the same emotion. We have the same grace the same Lord. So no difference at all, really. Um, the, also interesting here, the, just something I noted, is that in the feeding of the 5,000, I stress this a few times, Jesus is moved, Jesus' compassion moves him to do what? Remember? It moves him to teach. It moves him to teach them. Those are the Jews. But here, his compassion moves him to fulfill their physical hunger. But again, like I said, it's the same 
compassion. And it's later on to the disciples that he described that he turns this into a matter of teaching. This is this may sound a little confusing right now, but I think it it should become more clear when we look at Jesus' discussion with his with his apostles, with his disciples in private. Uh, another similarity here is that Jesus is using his disciples to do this. He's involving them in his um, in his miracle, in his feeding. He's distributing uh, to them. Um, there are seven loaves, and of course, there's some fish. Um, and another difference is Matthew. I should have put a, made a chart like I, I like I've done in the past, just to kind of put these side by side. Um, in uh, Mark chapter six, in the feeding of the five thousand, uh, we get Mark gives us kind of a seating arrangement. Jesus tells them to sit down in, in this specific seating arrangement, and that seating arrangement symbolized kind of a school setting. These are people who are who are sitting down to hear the Torah, to hear the teaching of Moses. Whereas here, there's no Mo Moses motif here, because these are Gentiles. So. Among the Jews, Jesus fulfills Moses. This is kind of the consummation. And among the Gentiles, there's no Moses anymore. He's kind of um, already, like he, he doesn't apply. And we're, and we're gonna get into the numbers too. And I, I haven't been able to find, I'm gonna look into some commentaries here, but why, you know, the 12 and the seven? I have my reason, I think it's clear. 12 is fulfillment. They're both holy numbers. 12 is fulfillment. That's where he fulfills the Old Testament. That's why there were 12 baskets left over. And this is the specific question that Jesus is going to ask his disciples later on. That's why there are 12 baskets in the case of the 5,000, but only seven, but there were seven baskets left over in the case of the Gentiles. And these baskets, there are different kinds of baskets, by the way. They're Jewish baskets versus Roman baskets. Roman baskets are way bigger. And so seven uh, is way, seven baskets left over is, is, is a ton ton of food but seven is another holy number and seven is the number well of, of sabbath rest but more specifically seven is three times four and three is the number for god and four is the number for the world and three plus four is reconciliation this is uh, this is a uh, uh well help me here my mind just went blank uh second corinthians chapter five uh, this is the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And then, of course, the apostles are sent out with, with what? But a plea to be you, world, be reconciled to God. This is seven. Three, God and the world reconciled. We're going to take that up in, in, in a little bit. I want to make one more point, though, before I open this up to discussion. And that is the what's kind of the, the Eucharistic language used here. You notice this? It's hard to hear this and not for your ears to perk up a little bit. Uh, when he says, and he took the seven loaves, verse six here, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples. Huh? This is the our Lord Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke and gave his disciples and said, um, so we have this repeated, this exact phrase, exact phrase, verbatim, repeated in Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, Luke 22, 1 Corinthians 11, in the, the, the institution text of the Lord's Supper. And a lot of people, you know, want to say, well, that make out of this a Eucharistic text. Well, this actually, this, this, this refers to the Lord's Supper. But I think it, 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 it teaches us something about the Lord's Supper, but what does it teach us? I think primarily it teaches us that God is gracious, that God satisfies us even more than we ask to be satisfied. And um, this is the way also that we have uh, Jesus, Jesus, these are his seminarians, and this is almost like a lesson. He's preparing them, you know, he's preparing them to do what he will then commission them to do. Uh, but he's preparing them to do it here in, in, a, in a very physical way. Whereas later, it's going to be in a very spiritual way, namely in administering salvation. Um, so very good. And of course, um, we'll get into the baskets because Jesus himself is going to make a point of that 
And then after this, he gets into the boat and he goes, he goes back into Jewish territory. Pastor Price, a couple things real quick. So um, Jane asks if you could repeat the part with the three and the four that it got choppy for her. Oh, yeah. uh, and then uh, Annie says, she heard somebody once say that in the text, Jesus feeds after three days, just like he feeds his body and his blood after being in the grave for three days. Is there a connection there? Um, is that something, is that something that we should attention to? Yeah. Is it on my, is it on my side? And it's kind of a, and a, I'm not sure. I think it was okay. It came in if, okay for me, just like one little skip, but it was, oh. um, uh, and and just like a seven minute warning here too I, I can't believe it already that we're but just to yeah if on that if you want if you're at a if you're at a spot to open things up or if you need to press forward to make cover more ground um no that's fine Look, that's fine uh we will get this is actually this is probably a good place to have this discussion um now the first question was was, was chopped up sorry maybe on, on my end i didn't hear it so well with the the raising of after jesus rose from the dead after three days could you explain that again yeah sure so um it's talking about how jesus here is feeding them after three days and in the lord's supper there there's a three days there it's just, i think that's the question is there a connection with the feeding of three days and and the three-day rest in the tomb yeah i don't know that's a that's a good question um I think, uh, you know, it's interesting because we're going to see later on, Jesus doesn't want to give signs. There, there's always meaning, you know, and uh, Jesus doesn't want to give signs except for the sign of Jonah. That's the only sign he wants to give. And of course, that's the three days in the tomb. There's, there's, there's obviously significance to, to being in the tomb for three days. Uh, and how many times he repeats that. And of course, we know that our Lord coming back to life, this is our, our risen Lord, is the one who presides over the table. Uh, it, and um, yeah, I, I have to think about that. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it, this, uh, I, I think what's important in this text, though, is that, that Jesus is, there's, there's a pattern of of working, a pattern of, of speaking, behaving, uh, that will inform the, uh, the, the pattern it, that, that it, with which he also serves us his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. And um, I, I think that that's important to note. It's the same Lord Jesus. It's the same compassion that he has, and he has it for all people. He's got it for the Jews, and he's got it for the Gentiles. Um, was there another question? Uh, only the request to repeat the discussion about the three and the four. Yeah, 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 the three and the four. I love numbers, you know. My, uh, I'm a, one of 12 kids, and I always was proud that 12 is a holy number. So I was proud that there was a holy number of kids. And then I had... God gave me seven kids and I was proud that we had seven because that's another holy seven is a holy number and then he gave us eight and I was like oh so much for seven but um seven is a holy number um do you want me to go I mean I, I don't really know the numbers that well but I know three is God holy 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 uh this is God four is the number for the world and that's because of the four winds or the four corners of the world okay or the four elements what are the four elements? Water, air, earth, and wind. No, no, no. Water, fire, earth, and wind. Um, these are earth. This is earth. So four is the is the word for the earth. Six is the uh, is the number of man. Six is the number of man. But six is often used as a as a uh, to to trump seven seven is the letter is the number of uh perfection ten is also a number of perfection but seven is perfection and i think well jesus rested on the seventh day um but i think that seven has it 
its true significance is it's three plus four. Three and four makes seven. Three is God reconciled with the world. For God so loved the world. Uh, for uh, for God, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So that's where we have seven. And, it, and, and it's, it's completion because it refers to uh, God's love, God's grace for the Gentiles. You could say peace. On the seventh day is peace and rest and Sabbath. Well, in Christ, there is Sabbath. And in Christ, there is peace on earth, right? Goodwill toward men. Uh, this is a peace between the, earth, the world and God. And that's why we have the word seven. You know, it's not necessary to make this point, but I do think it's interesting. The Bible makes a, a lot of numbers. Uh, and not just the Bible, but all ancient literature. Um, you know, like in Revelation, we have 666, right? Well, it's not just in the Bible. It's also in uh, Agamemnon, the chorus in Agamemnon. In, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is it Sophocles, I think? Uh, ancient Greek tragedian. Uh, the chorus is talking about the fate of Agam Agamemnon. And it talks about uh, the casting of the of of the die of the dice, uh, in that the, after the casting of the dice, it reads six six six, and of course this is a bad omen of something horrible to come. Uh, so we have numbers uh, that have always had symbolism in the ancient mind, and I think uh, here it is again, it's God and man reconciled. I have to note that that is in Euripides, part of the Orestia. Ah, Euripides, Orestia. I got both the author and the work wrong. Well, so much. Yeah, I studied. I'm sure it, was, I'm sure it showed up in a couple of different places. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> That's good. How'd I you didn't know about that. That's cool. curious. <laughs> no, I didn't do it. Uh, Jen uh, from Kenya uh, made the note. So you, brilliant, wonderful. Thank you. I love it. Um, and uh, perfect. I, I, I'm all against all your numerology stuff. We'll have to debate about it sometime because I always like to say if it says, um, why does it say seven baskets? And the answer is because there were seven baskets. <laughs> I, hey, Brian, I've always taken that position. And you know, you know who actually corrected me it was David Warner. It was at a Winkle in a pastor's meeting, secret pastor's meeting in Montana. And I made that exact point. It says, well, it happened. And he said, yes, but, and then he referred me to John chapter 21, many things happened such that he, the, we would have to write so many books that the world couldn't contain them, but the Holy Spirit determined that this be written. And so we should pay special attention to this. I thought, well, that's a great argument. So the fact that the Holy Spirit causes these words to be written should give us special cause to stop and reflect on its significance. I don't know. That was Warner's argument. Take it, I'll take, take I'll it, take it up. It. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, you know, sometimes I was, we were reading Ruth the other day and, and remember Boaz sends back six things of wheat and Naomi says, Ooh, she understands that was code. He's not going to stop until you're getting married because six means that, you know, the Lord rested on the seventh day. He sent six barley things back. So he's communicating in code with the number. So no. I think that, you know, you, you have this happening. So we, we do got to give it a, a chance to be communication. But I think sometimes, you know, why are there 24 elders? Because there's 12 tribes. If there would be 13 tribes, if the Lord would have given them more kids, like, you know. <laughs> That's right. Oh, wow. Okay. I like it. Anyway, I, know, I got into this because of the Revelation stuff. All the dispensationalists want to find all these secret numbers in Revelation, and, and anyway, it, it just it, it soured me to the whole to the whole thing. That's my. I agree. Opinion. I agree, a hundred percent. Although I'll tell you something, six is an imitation. You do see it all over the place. I know they get into it. I know we're past time here, but I know that a lot of these dispensationalists get into it, and a lot of these, like seriously, a lot of like the the 
they call them right wing. I hate the spectrum thing, but right wing conspiracy theories and all that stuff. People get into dispensationalism and millennialism. There's a lot of dangerous stuff there. I totally agree. However, uh, it, it is true that Satan does, he flips around uh, in a lot of the satanic rituals, he flips things around and he likes the number six. And why? Because six is the number of man. And you, if you can put man above God, that's all Satan wants. He, that, that, that's what he wanted in the temptation. He wants to put six above. And you know what? Here's, this is interesting. The gay flag, the gay rainbow flag, compare that to God's rainbow. How many colors does the rainbow have in nature? It has seven. It includes indigo. The gay flag has six. Now, I'm just, I rest my case. <laughs> I rest my case. Well, there, I'm convinced now. So, <laughs> All right, let, let, on that note, let's pray. And then uh, we can talk about gay rainbows later. All right. <clears throat> Lord God, Heavenly Father, in your eternal wisdom, you uh, had mercy on us and you uh, decided to save us in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have sent him to us and that you have recorded his life and his works for us to know him and through him to know your eternal will, your grace towards us so that we may always have heart and never, never despair and to never think that, uh, that the things of this world are, uh, are, are too much to bear, but that we always have hope in the one thing that matters and that is the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake and life eternal which you have guaranteed to us and sealed to us in the blood of your dear son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks, David. This is great. I, I, I uh, it occurred to me, I was, I was, you're not supposed to think anything else when you're praying, but that's all, that's always that happens. And so it occurred to me that the argument for the numbers, and by the way, let me make it to where other people can jump in and also unmute themselves i gotta change the security this is the um so if you guys have questions you could but the fact that the, that the holy spirit has given us two feedings of the thousands and given us the details of the numbers to differentiate them from each other is probably an indication that we should pay attention you know so you do have this kind of the jewish you, you have like the jewish numbers with the jewish feeding of the five thousand and then you got the kind of gentile numbers with the gentile feeding of the four thousand so so um, that's great. Yeah, exactly. By the way, if you, cause you seem to be pretty prepared. I think that you have a lot in your arsenal on this. And um, if you want to argue about it, we should do it next week. Um, like uh, over this uh, text, because uh, Jesus mentions this too. And I, I think it's fascinating and none of the commentaries really explain why, but he's just like, okay, explain to me this. Why were there seven? Why were there twelve in the case of the disciple or of the five thousand? Why were there seven in the case of the four thousand? Do you not understand? Yeah. I, I, and then uh, and then here's what I do after hearing that. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I do. Still, so it is a curious. So the twelve, right, is the uh, that's the that's the number of Israel. I mean, it's three times yeah. four, which is. So that's the number of Israel. So 12 always seems to be connected to the doctrine of election. So when you have the vision of the church and its perfection in Revelation, it's 12,000 times 12, 144,000. So 12 is connected to election. All those that are mine will be mine. Whereas seven seems to be the number of life and abundance. So, so, that, so seven is a connected, a Gentile thing. So, Yeah, yeah, it's a Gentile thing. Yeah, right. Interesting, yeah. Anyway, uh, it, 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 yeah. I just I, I always think you, it's 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 like it's all those you know the, um you see these things and it's like if you read in the book of Leviticus every seventeenth number you find the sentence Donald Trump is the Antichrist or whatever and you're like uh, and and you're like well I don't trust you to read the words as they're written much less to read every seventeenth letter <laughs> like. If you're starting to find all the secret hidden meanings, but you can't just get to the actual plain meaning of what's sitting there on the surface, you know? That's the, that's the thing, that's the key right there. All the things we see and yet we don't see. I'm not gonna put on scuba gear, scuba gear for a guy that doesn't even know how to breathe when he's on the surface. 
<laughs> well, that's why I'm always nervous about the numerology thing. <laughs> <laughs> <Scooby -Goo. laughs> I love Ethel it. mentions a pastor once mentioned to me that Israelites knew to sit according to their tribes and would also sit in groupings to be more easily numbered. Wow. Yeah. They were ordered, and, and it had to do with the, I mean, this was done in the congregation uh, at the foot of Sinai. The, the, the great kahal is what it is, the assembly. That's how you learn. They were, that's the thing. Israel is a school, and that's how they're, they were set up. They were arranged to be taught the law, to be taught the word of God, the Torah. Um, but, yeah. Anyone else got any thoughts or Lois and Gary, good to see you guys. Anyone else wants to jump in or I, I asked, by the way, where people are from. I know we've got Africa represented. Where else? Are we? We've got Finland represented. We've got and the most exotic of all, Iowa. Iowa. All right. Kishka, uh, Iowa represented. Krista points out that uh, eight is the eternal number. And so, of course, the eighth day signifies eternal life that's great thanks and of course that's the day of service that's what your kids are until you have like nine and if you have nine kids you're like nine is nothing we either got to get to 10 the law that's right <laughs> well that's the way i think that's just the way i think it's you know it's, it's all about the numbers but thank you very much Krishna. now i have eighth day that's eternal that's the sig that's the meaning of my my the size of my family job had 11 kids right Job 11 had a, means nothing, though. Why? Well, I, I want you know if he would have just had one more, it could have instead of the children of, of Israel, it would have been the children of Job, and maybe from Job we would have the twelve tribes. You know. <laughs> uh, How about this? The 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 dispensationalists love the number a thousand, and they say that that's ten times ten times ten. So you've got three tens, and, and they try to they try to measure it out that way. But my my thinking on a thousand is that, that the oldest person ever to live, Methuselah, six hundred and nine hundred and sixty nine years, right? Nine hundred sixty nine, nine sixty eight, nine sixty nine, and and so my thinking on a thousand is a thousand years is the is the age that no one ever reached. Even the oldest of us never got to a thousand. So when the Lord brings it up, He says, "For me, a day is like a thousand years." In other words, you could never even dream of getting to a thousand. And yet to me, it's like, it's like a day. It would have been so better. So that's a thousand. That's great. What's that? Yeah, that's great. It would have been better if <clears throat> Methuselah lived to 999, just to make that point even more clear. Yeah, 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 I know. Well, you know, once you get to, once you, you got to think that once you hit your 950th birthday, everyone's like, whoa you think you'll make a thousand that's how whenever anybody gets to like 95 96 they start wondering i wonder if you'll make a hundred i wonder if you make a and by the time you get to 97 or 98 years old you're like well i might as well live a few more <laughs> most people they're like they get to 90 they're like okay i'm ready for the lord jesus to take me home but once you get to 96 you're like well maybe i got another few laps in me just to say i made it to 100 and get the birthday party and the the rose from the president or whatever you know, I don't know if it has this been your experience. <clears throat> My experience <clears throat> as a pastor with 90 some year olds, they, they tend to be strong, like unusually strong people. And that's the reason why they are, they reached that such a high age. And so it's like, it's not even surprising then when the nine, you know, for me, I, they, they, they tend to, you can see the longevity in them. They're, they're some of the toughest people I've, I've met. And it's like, thank you. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And also, and you try to look for the thing. You're like, you're, you made it to a 90, you made it to a hundred. How did you do it? And the answer is you didn't try. <laughs> like everyone who's, they're like, well, you know, I made sure to only smoke one pack of cigarettes every day and <laughs> drink only one pot of coffee every day and eat eggs and bacon only once a day. You know, it's like all the kind of hits that you think are going to increase longevity. Like you didn't do any of that stuff. That's right. No. That's right. <clears throat> well, that's... Uh... Jane asks, what's the scripture about a thousand years like a day? That's from Psalm 90. A thousand years occurs 
three times in the Bible. So Psalm 90, which is the oldest Psalm, that's the Psalm of Moses. And it's the Psalm of mortality. That's the Psalm that we say when we lower the casket door. Psalm 90. And then it's quoted in second Peter where Peter says, is that sec first or second Peter? Second Peter, I think where it says the Lord is not slow about his promises, but long suffering. Uh, and we have to remember that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. So, so Peter quotes Psalm 90 to refer to the time of patience between the ascension and second coming. And then John gets the thousand years in Revelation 20, the vision of the thousand years of the devil being bound so the gospel can go to the nations. Yeah, and there, you know, this is just, you look at this, where millennialists get the thousand years from Revelation 20. And every single other thing here that is mentioned is obviously to be taken figuratively holding in the hand the key, bottomless pit, great chain, dragon, serpent, you know, uh, and then bound him for a thousand years. Well, we know that everything else is an image which symbolizes something else, except for the thousand years. When we get there, that they take that literally. That's what I don't understand. Yeah. It's, all, it's, the only, it's the only thing they take literally. I, I don't know how anybody could take a thousand years literally. It's, it's like a bottomless pit. And it's like, now, wait a minute. If it doesn't have a bottom, it's a tube. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, <laughs> when you say bottomless pit, you know you're not talking about something literal. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I, I mean, I, the church has done that, I mean, for a long time. You know, the church was, they, there was a kind of a millennialism that we, it, it crept into the Lutheran church for a while, you know, Leia, you remember a guy, Leia had that, he had a bit of. All sorts of Lutherans and great church fathers, Irenaeus, you know, oh, it's just nuts. Uh, their, their, their eschatology is what we call it. The, the end times, their doctrine of the end times is just, uh. It's difficult. And, you know, we Lutherans don't really have, I guess we're amillennialists, but we just don't, we know that we're not millennialists. <laughs> Basically our only position, yeah. but we don't really, they're like three different interpretations of how to interpret the millennium. That we you know, that would be a, that with. would be a fun topic to take up next when we finish the gospel of Mark is to do a series on, on uh, eschatology. That'd be fun. Lois mentions that her mic is not working. She's praising God for parents and parent-in-laws who both lived to 99 in a few months. Wow. I've lived in the faith, so God be praised. The Lord numbers our days and gives us just what we need. Yeah, that's, you know, my, my in my family, my grandpa and his brother died young at 71. But all of their cousins and all the other Preusses lived in their 90s and stuff. I don't know what happened. I mean, it, it must be in the... No, because their dad died at like 70 some too. I don't know, we just didn't get longevity on our side, but huh, it's all right. Yeah, that's right. The Lord is 